the main, main reason to do this work in, uh, was actually the Chernobyl accident, um, which many people um, still remember, and uh, many people got over it. Uh, it left a problem uh, for me, uh, and that you know, when this happened, I was, are we really so stupid uh, to put such risk potentials into our world just for uh, a little comfort? And uh, can't we do better? We fly to the moon. We uh, have such beautiful things like, um, uh, like, uh, great, uh, like general theory of uh, relativity. And so can't we think of solutions uh, which are compatible with the way we want uh, to live? And not only we, but also, uh, say, humankind in total. It's not only this generation which is alive, but also we will there will be people after us. And <clears throat> so, um, uh, wait a minute, this is not from my file yet. So what do I do now? The next slide, and point the remote there, the lines up. OK. So, and um, uh, as an introduction, let me uh, just uh, begin, uh, because all matter is uh, sometimes serious, with a joke. And uh, the, the joke was as follows. So there are, this, uh, two, there are two planets, Jim and Joe, huh? and they meet, with their orbits, they intersect closely every few million years. And last time when they intersected, um, Jim saw so Joe coming and saying, hey, Joe, what's wrong with you this time? You are not looking well. Yeah. You are so pale, what's wrong? Well, Joe says, Joe, um, you're right, I don't feel well. Uh, yeah, what's happen happening? Uh, I'm perspiring, I'm in heat waves. I don't just feel well. Well, you should see the doctor. Ah, oh, that's true, that's what I'm coming from. And what did the doctor say, what are you having? Well, the doctor said, I'm having mankind. Ah, oh, says Jim, don't worry, I had it as well. It went away by itself. <laughs> <laughs> and um, <clears throat> so we are... Uh, on the, uh, <laughs> are we Jim? <laughs> or Joe, uh, yeah, Jim uh, got rid of it. So that's uh, why the question, uh, say, is interesting. How can 10 billion people live sustainably on Earth? And, um, so, uh, and I think here is a, a potential answer. And this um, answer I will talk to you about, does it take global a solution model for humankind security? And... Um, enabling a sustainable world for 10 billion people on the planet for three, which sounds more or less impossible. Uh, of course, it is impossible as long as we live like now. But if you change to clean power from deserts, many things can be changed. And that's what I want to uh, give you some ideas about uh, and uh, give you at the beginning a brief calendar of uh, desertic milestones. So the most important milestone, uh, I think, oops, was... 1986, this Chernobyl accident that I already described, and which left me with that question. Uh, as a physicist, I was always interested in energy. I, I believed in fusion at that time. No, not really at that time anymore. But um, nuclear energy, also for me, it was the end of nuclear energy. Now Fukushima is the end of, nu for, of nuclear energy for other people, like, for instance, the German Chancellor, Mrs. Merkel. OK. Um, uh, then, the founding of the Trans-Mediterranean Renewable Energy Cooperation track was uh, in 2003 when I was retired and I said, well, it doesn't happen by itself, even though it uh, looks reasonable and uh, possible uh, to me uh, that we have this way out, but uh, things didn't develop in that direction, so maybe it's better to begin to organize it. And since I had some free time and was used to cooperate globally with uh, experiments in elementary particles, that was United States, Japan, Soviet Union, um, China, uh, Europe. So uh, why not uh, try then uh, to make an uh, appropriate uh, collaboration, get involved people, so, or the possibly interested people involved. And that we made studies, and uh, when the studies were done, we also began to change the name. Uh, Desert Tech, because Trek was trans Iranian Renewable Energy Corporation, but when there was a guy from India coming and saying, could we make a Trek India? I said, well, this is maybe not so a uh, good combination. <laughs> uh, and um, some, at some point, uh, why, why not Desert Tech? We want to use deserts, 
uh, and technology um, for global energy and climate security. Okay, uh, we made a white paper, and this white paper was presented, uh, summarized studies, or such a pile of studies, in a small brochure, and that could be read by uh, people from outside the uh, science world, and um, that was uh, then presented to the European <laughs> Parliament in the end of 2007, already in January 2008, uh, there was a response from French president's office. Uh, they are interested in that. Oh, France, nuclear power, what do they want? what's happening? Yes, they were thinking about the Mediterranean Union, and they needed projects for that. Uh, and um, so they were really interested, and that was the reason why they created the Mediterranean Solar Plan, based on our uh, studies. So uh, suddenly it was on the political agenda, with just uh, this way. And um, then um, once it has, was on the political, the political agenda, it was also easy to approach others, because it was an official thing. Uh, and um, so um, the, uh, to get industry, big industry, industrial leaders uh, interested, so I said, well, look, it's going mm -hmm. to happen. Do you want to be... Uh, part of the uh, game or do you want to uh, lose? Well, no, I want to be part of it. And uh, even though uh, so I'm not really fully convinced, but better <coughs> to, to uh, go along with it rather than to um, miss the train. And so was the Desert Tech, uh, Industrial Initiative was founded and also this group of, trans, uh, of track people, we created then also a legal body. Until that point in time, we had no legal body. It was just phone numbers, a list of phone numbers on, and emails. Uh, and um, <coughs> a Desertec Foundation uh, founded, uh, so we are collecting some money to organize some work. And uh, last year, uh, in, um, yeah, so th uh, by the end of 2009, the initiative uh, was founded as a, uh, as a limited, uh, as a real uh, <coughs> legal entity, and uh, the, so the industrial initiative was founded as a legal entity, and um, by the end of last year, in October, we founded a Desertec University network, mainly universities from North Africa and the Middle East, because they are, uh, need some uh, support, they have they need some development, they need um, to be able uh, to do it by themselves if they want to become really uh, more than just an observer in these countries, uh, that these countries really um, make it, embrace it as, as their own thing. They need to have the competence for it. Okay, so that was all achieved. Uh, so these are the major steps. <coughs> now, um, <coughs> I'll come, be, come to the subject. To me, as a physicist uh, who has a very limited knowledge about humankind, um, the two most important events in the history of mankind, I think, are first, about 250,000 years ago, the appearance of Homo sapiens sapiens, that's what we are now, double sapiens, or two star sapiens, and, um, or sapiens, I'm sorry, uh, sapiens and sapiens. And then 1985 was another important event, namely the number of uh, Homo sapiens exceeds the carrying capacity of planet Earth. And that's what you uh, see in this view graph. Here is the, um, the top curve is the total world population and uh, segmented into uh, more developed countries, with the lower green and the upper violet um, or pink uh, is the less developed countries and you see where the growth really is going on now, while the um, more developed are stagnating. Okay, so uh, one can say, well, that's uh, uh, what it is and what, it, what we expect it will be, why it levels off, there are some reasons. Um, maybe it will not, but uh, that's expected. But it turned out by an analysis of how much carrying capacity the Earth has for people living like they live, it was about 5 billion people, and that was achieved in 1985, plus minus 5 years or so. And it's not an exact date, but uh, in that time. So until that point in time, humankind enjoyed an era of free expansion. When there any was, was something was limited, you went to somewhere else. Um, North, Af North America was a place for Irish people to go to in the past. Well, uh, so uh, we could always expand, but now somehow this is not uh, possible anymore, and so we are using, uh, living in an era of overuse of resources, 
And to do that, you, you need an organized balance and not a free expansion. So we, the, humankind has to organize itself much differently from the past if it wants to cope with the real situation. Now, this uh, carrying capacity is five billion people, but there is a but, there's a problem. Carrying capacity is going down. We are driving it down to about maybe three billion people by overusing it, by climate change and other events which de uh, destroy uh, lots of uh, agricultural uh, traditions and so on. So that's going down. And at the same time, numbers are moving up. So this, I think, is the issue of humankind security. And that is in question. Uh, somehow, 10 billion, uh, uh, 10 pe billion people on the world for three does not really work. So we have to change something. And one way how one could get out of this dilemma could be uh, by a transition to renewable energies. Um, we could raise the uh, <coughs> carrying capacity to 10 billion. Because if you do look into this analysis, about 50% of the um, footprint, of human footprint, is, from the fossil, is due to the fossil fuel energy sector. So if you get rid of that footprint, um, people, uh, population could double. So it's not so uh, a vague idea. So it, it could double. Uh, but right now, by continuing with fossil fuels, we're driving down. So we have two winning points. We would not drive down uh, the ecosystem Earth uh, if we stop with fossil fuels, and we would um, eliminate the, uh, the present burden. Um, and okay, so that's uh, the uh, whole the context in which uh, now this attack is embedded. So humankind security. Winning or losing the human race, think of the planets, and um, so human we know human security. This is security of integrity of individuals or of groups uh, because of there are minorities which are threatened or conflicts. There are dictators. There are local natural disasters or a lack of human rights. But so, you, but human kind security is man-made threats against living conditions of human species. That's a different uh, thing. And um, so like nuclear arms race was a threat to humankind security, then the ozone depletion was something like that. Climate change is something like that. The civil use of nuclear power is something like that. The acidification of oceans is something like that. Overuse and degradation of soils is something like that. And this is a global uh, issues and uh, we have no global institutions to deal with it really so they have to come or we have to develop them and we have to be fast with uh, such uh, developments. Anyway, so I will give you an example now how with Desert Tech we could uh, maybe uh, solve the climate change and uh, civilization issues because um, energy, uh, our civilization on which we depend uh, needs energy. Okay, so what is needed in terms of energy for a sustainable world of 10 billion people this plan for three. And here I will show to you what I call the humankind security octet. So here you see the globe. And um, first of all, we need reliable energy supply for our civilization. We need more for 10 billion, 10 billion people would be needing more water and more food. There more materials. We need um, two degree climate stability. We need Biodiversity would need global and intergenerational justice. Uh, we would need more civilization and wealth per person. And uh, we would need a limitation to the world population. Because if growth continues, we'll never catch up. As well, so get into a balance. OK, so re more reliable energy is just this means that the um, energy must be inexhaustible. Uh, the sources must not never end. Secondly, more water and food. This just requires more energy for reprocessing, desalination, irrigation, fertilizing, and so on. More materials also requires just energy because many, many materials we can recycle by reprocessing that requires energy. Climate stability also, that means that all this energy is clean. So we need 
not more, only we also need the clean energy. And uh, climate two degree climate stability is the basic, uh, very important precondition for biodiversity. So if you want to have biodiversity, we need to have a stable climate. Then uh, a global and intergenerational justice means that there is also energy for future generations. So it must be inexhaustible for that reason. For more civilization and wealth per capita, we just need energy um, of this kind. And why do we need more wealth per person? Well, there is, we want to come to the next point, population, to limit world population. And there is one proven method to limit the population, that is wealth. All countries which are wealthy have a declining population. They need, we need imports already everywhere in Europe, almost everywhere. Uh, and the growth is happening in the developing and underdeveloped countries. So, um, okay, so that's why wealth per capita is not bad for the future, but it's, it's indispensable for the future, I think. Otherwise, we'll have one solve that limitation problem. Okay, so much to the, and so that means that clean and secure energy or power, that's the key to a safe world for 10 billion people. So, if I could convince you of that, then we should now ask the question, how do we get this energy? So how much power would now address just the sector of electricity? Because with electricity, you can do almost everything in the end, um, except for flying right now. But even then, you could produce fuels with electricity. Now, um, uh, the ever, how much does a person need? Here you see a few numbers of present consumption in terms of megawatt hours per year and per person. And the uh, United States is at 12. Germany is at 6.4. So if they, with better efficiency, we come to 5 megawatt hours per person. So we have to do some um, extreme uh, achievements also in, 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 in uh, efficiencies to get to that. But I think this is possible. But then uh, electromobility. If we uh, introduce electromobility, this will add more power demand. and that. <coughs> about be one megawatt hour per person a year. So th don't take these numbers better than 20%. It is just to see the ballpark. Where, what are we talking about? And um, that means we have six megawatt hour per year per person. And for a world with 10 billion people, that means 60 petawatt hours. So 60,000 terawatt hours. Right now, a world consumption is 18 petawatt hours. So we have to go, we'll go from 18 to 60. And um, if now, say, half of this energy would be supplied uh, from this desert tech source, uh, from, uh, because we have, other, we have also wind, we have geothermal, many other sources, but so if half of it should, could, uh, is it possible to supply ha uh, half of it from clean power from desert? So that would be 30 petawatt hours per year. You can make an assessment what that means for uh, what you do you have to do in these deserts of the world. <coughs> and that is here, since there are about 2,500 solar hours per year in the deserts, that means that you need collectors for 12,000 solar gigawatt. 12,000 gigawatt solar collectors globally. That is about 20 square meter per person. So that's what everybody, in addition to his home, he needs uh, an area of 20 square meter in, in some desert. Now uh, comes the real point. So if you say, well, we, but this is nothing for, that we can maybe have a tooth uh, in 100 years. We want to have it by the middle of the century because of climate change. Um, then it would mean that we have 35 years for real deployment. That is one gigawatt per day to deploy collectors for one gigawatt per day. So this is really a big industry. It's about one third of... Uh, a, a, a company like Volkswagen would be needed about uh, to do that. Um, so, uh, so you see, uh, it is um, not uh, something people do uh, in their backyard anymore. Not only. Mm -hmm. And um, so, one gigawatt per day means uh, just for the collectors, which replace the fuel, is one to two billion euro per day um, turnover. And that's about 35% of military, military expenses. Now, since this is for humankind security, so we have that money. We just have to change some titles in the defense budgets. We are defending uh, humankind security and not national security anymore. I think this is a new thing. We have to replace 
national security just by humankind security. And this, why should we have national security if we are in the process of globalization? That's anyway uh, from past century uh, national security. Um, so here we do have the resources. And uh, so saving the planet will become also the largest business case in the decades ahead of us. And that's an interesting case for industry and for employment. Okay, so it's not really bad, the whole situation. So we have an opportunity. Now, how can we uh, harvest these energies? Well, there is wind power. Uh, wind and solar are the working horses, uh, from my understanding. And here is a, uh, an assessment of the global wind power resources with some uh, criteria for uh, um, commercial, uh, on, uh, on the uh, commercial efficiency. So onshore, we, we can harvest about 690 petawatt hours and offshore 150 petawatt hours. So, um, and that is around 800 or 850 and we needed uh, at most 30 from wind in addition. No? So there's enough. So the um, resource is not a problem. Um, then if you take solar, now solar collectors, with these technologies that we concentrate light, uh, generate heat, in the, and then uh, with the heat raise steam and drive turbine. Uh, so a conventional power plant, a thermal power plant just with solar steam. Uh, here are two uh, various uh, technologies, uh, just sketch. I don't want to go into details of that. But they are all uh, running and working, and, uh, and they are not really extreme high tech. It's it's um, pretty can be built in many uh, countries, practically in most of countries where you can fix a car. And um, okay, so that gives us access to the energy from deserts, also a worldwide resource. Now, if you ask how much energy is in these deserts, you see this little red square. This red square receives as much energy from the sun as humankind is using. Is using. So, so all energy we are using is would be just hit by solar energy in such a little square deserts. Or in six hours, this deserts receive as much energy from the sun as humankind is using within a year. So the resource is big. Now, uh, if you want to make power out of it, we have some efficiencies, and then we need more. So uh, if you want to make this 30 petawatt power, uh, then uh, the la uh, larger red square would be needed uh, as a, a space for the collectors. And that would be uh, pretty much 1% of the useful deserts. Not all deserts are useful because they are steep and mountainous or they have sand. Uh, so just the useful ones. Um, OK, so that place is there. So we can go uh, and look further into how, what are the problems, what are the options. So the econo economic power potential, or the potential of economic power is about 3,000 petawatt hours a year, if you do an assessment, and we are, we are asking for about 30. So that's this 1%. Okay. Now, um, we, uh, from there, we need to go to the various supply to the various regions. And the nice thing of deserts is that they go around the globe, in the northern and the southern hemisphere, and these numbers are these petawatt hours per year in these various desert regions. And you see um, around the globe, there are everywhere deserts with enough uh, solar um, resource. So we really can say this is, um, can be uh, expanded or can be, uh, uh, we can build a, a global supply system on, on, based on this. And um, now one, deserts have one problem when you talk, when you talk about thermal power plants. Normally thermal power plants, is, you recognize them by, from, uh, by steam, uh, by um, um, dump, what is dump? Yeah, steam, yeah. Uh, or condensed steam. Uh, uh, this is from the condenser, not from the turbine. It's from the cooling. So uh, you see, uh, so you need water for cooling. But all your cars, none of your cars is running on water cooling. They're all running on air cooling. Water is only internally. Uh, uh, also power plants can be running on um, air cooling. And such an uh, area like that is enough to cool uh, the waste heat, so-called waste heat, away, which is collected by these two long collector rows. So it is a small addition. It is possible, it's, it's working. Such a pl this plant is uh, a photograph, not an animation. 
And so we have no water consumption. We can do dry cooling and also dry cleaning of the mirrors is also possible. So um, therefore, deserts, we have the technology for deserts. And um, why now uh, not photovoltaics only, and we also use photovoltaics, but uh, the thing which uh, is but typically for the deserts is uh, the direct light is there. We can concentrate and um, make this heat. And the advantage of heat is you can store heat. You can generate heat at daytime. You may use it to raise the steam, or you can run it into a big block of uh, a, 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 into a tank, which contains molten salt. And you just warm that molten salt up to four or five hundred whatever centigrade. And at night, you generate the steam uh, from the heat in that uh, molten salt tank. So um, therefore. We have, uh, this technology gives us a firm capacity. And that's exactly what the fossil fuel power plants and the nuclear power plants now are. You can run them by demand. And this you could also operate by demand. And so this is particularly well suited to get rid of fossil fuels and nuclear power. OK. So um, I just, uh, I think this is maybe uh, much detail. So it, again, so uh, there's sun, there is the uh, block diagram. Sun is where the collector is. Then you have a thermal uh, energy storage and uh, steam you get out of any, either, any, either one of those or even from both. Uh, and then you can generate a steam uh, and power uh, by demand. And, with the, um, and if there is a week or two weeks of clouds, uh, you have uh, some uh, spare fossil fuels and you can uh, uh, raise the steam with fossil fuels by a normal uh, burner. So, one week per year is 2% uh, of a year. So 2 or 5% of power generation still can go with, uh, can come, uh, be as, uh, connected with uh, CO2 emissions. And the cooling can be done by seawater, and that can then be used as desalination. We have fresh water, very interesting for these desert regions. So you have to go near coastlines. <coughs> OK. Oops. Now we have to transmit it. There is a technology for low loss, long distance transmission that's high voltage direct current, high voltage. If you double the voltage uh, by which you transmit energy uh, or electricity over a wire, uh, the losses go to one square of the doubling to a quarter. If you make 10 times the voltage, the losses go down to 1%. It's simple uh, electricity. Um, you, you learn it at school already, uh, uh, Ohm's law, basically, and the definition of power. Of, um, yeah, power. Okay, uh, that's one thing. Uh, and um, here also you need much less space. This is for a 7 gigawatt transmission. The top line is 400 kV AC, that, uh, what we are having now. The top uh, bottom uh, point is just 800 kV and uh, DC, so they, you need much less space. So you can... Um, reuse or you can uh, change over existing power lines to include also uh, the transmission uh, with uh, you need about uh, only 20% of the space for the same electricity. And if you go to a higher voltage, maybe you get even better. Anyway, so this is the reason why um, uh, uh, well, the low losses, it's only 3% of uh, 1,000 kilometers. It can go under water through cables. Uh, uh, AC, you cannot drive through long cables. Then you lose all the energy for charging and discharging the polarity, changing the polarity of the cable. Uh, so here you do that only once, and then um, you have no losses within the cable uh, and or in the uh, capacity of the cable. Okay, so uh, uh, it is uh, better. As, long, as soon as you have about four, 500 kilometers on land, land and, and about 50 or 60 kilometers under water. Now, uh, with all these things that I've just showed to you, these technologies, the area of Yumina, Europe, Middle East, and North Africa, we have studied uh, a system including all the potential resources and um, to of course, it is possible. Uh, now we have optimized it and see, uh, see uh, how can it be changed from where we are now to a system which has 
low enough emissions for the two centigrade goal. And uh, here you see from the, uh, a, the result of a study uh, from year 2000 to 2050, and the brown uh, line up, uh, field up in the top one is um, this uh, solar thermal power uh, from deserts. And you see that takes over the most. On top, the two top ones is uh, the blue one is uh, desalination. That's an additional demand there. And then uh, the second is export of solar to Europe. So, uh, and the fossils can go down. And in, for the European, uh, on the top, on the bottom uh, a figure, you see the bottom is, is nuclear, the pink one, and uh, the pink one is running out. So this, in this study, we investigate if the nuclear can be given up. Yes, it can be given up. And um, at the same time, what are the emissions? Uh -huh. So, and, and the amount of exports to Europe was not that we wanted to have uh, at as much as possible or as little as possible, but what was necessary as a firm power capacity to always have in the grid more firm power than the maximum power demand in the year. So photovoltaics firm power capacity is zero. Huh? If the peak demand is in uh, December in the morning at, uh, at eight o'clock, sometimes there is no sun and then you have no photovoltaic contribution. So we need other uh, resources for that uh, point in time, and also it may also be a calm, there may be no wind at that time. So, uh, so uh, taking all of this, that led to the 15%. Uh, then we always have a stable um, supply system, and you see uh, the various um, other contributions. Um, this is the blue one is uh, uh, wind, and the... Um, uh, gray blue one is uh, so, uh, is uh, hydropower uh, the other uh, big ones uh, for the european uh, supply in this study and the fossil ones are coming down and getting smaller okay as a result in terms of uh, decarbonization of the electricity generation it's, it's minus 81% as over continuing as we are as we are now ah you have seen that anyway I, how do i get back so it is something <coughs> missing here. Um, so this reduction is good enough for the goal that we are pursuing. Oops. No. Now let's address the situation for worldwide and see what is the requirement for a worldwide solution. Now, uh, of course, we will not have one big power plant or one area in one desert. Uh, we will be using, uh, it will be distributed over all deserts and the typical size of a power plant will be about 200 megawatt uh, because of uh, the thermal transmission lines that you need. Uh, and if it's to make it too big, you have to a higher losses. Already by system, by its uh, system properties, you wouldn't go to very, uh, like two gigawatt uh, power plants. Okay, um, and from here, uh, you um, connect uh, expected, and then we have connected the expected world population by this uh, super grid. Uh, to good desert sites. And you see, uh, <clears throat> just to give you an impression, if you uh, think of uh, 3,000 kilometers distance from deserts, uh, what kind of, uh, you will cover almost all populated regions of the world. You can reach them. And so more, more than 90%, actually more than 95% uh, of world population is in a distance less than 3,000 kilometers from deserts. So the uh, uh, potential is there. Now, on, based on that, Desertec develops a global solar plan, and that looks like following. So we start with the demand side. Here is an extrapolation, uh, a projection of the expected population in the year 2025. And uh, you see just the, big, the urban areas, uh, uh, if they, uh, cities or so, if they have more than 1.5 million, uh, they are shown here, and you see where uh, the big demands are going to be. And um, now we have, you see, frames that include these um, populated regions, and these frames also include desert areas. And you see uh, the Yumina frame is there. This is one of the largest, this is, uh, and that we have studied in detail. So Theric is working. The others are smaller. Maybe they are difficult if you have to go to lots of water, uh, but that is going will be subject of a, 
now an ongoing study. And uh, if you, uh, so these 10 de important demand regions for desert tech, the frames include just the high, all populations, uh, almost all, and just the good desert sites. And if you move on, if you overlay this pattern of frames to a, a world picture with deserts, you see that uh, they all uh, contain desert regions. So they all have access to deserts. So it is really possible uh, from uh, desert regions to supply the world, uh, uh, except for a, 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 few, a few percent. Good. So how to organize the transition now at a high speed and low cost? Uh, if you have enough time, you can say, okay, fine. Uh, it's a, uh, we, somehow, in some point, in 100 years, we have solved it. But uh, time is running out. So, because there are tipping points. We don't know how long the climate will be stable. It may take, the climate change may become self-supporting by uh, feedbacks, and since the two centigrade limitation can no, no longer be kept. And so, uh, th and to stay within that limit, of two degree, how much more carbon dioxide can be allowed to be emitted into or injected into the atmosphere? This is a number one can calculate or at least make an uh, assessment for. And this has been done by a German institution, um, a government uh, advisory board, and they found that if uh, we continue with emissions as in 2008, from now on, we would have 24 years. And then, atmosphere is full, but the two centigrade is concerned. So then we can forget about talking a two degree centigrade. Now we have COP17 uh, coming up, plus 24 is uh, 41. Yes, so COP41, we should already cancel. <laughs> uh, it, uh, it's no, no longer necessary. Um, Okay, and such a result, a 20-year exit strategy, this will not come by trial and error. I think we need really an uh, understood and organized way a strategy. And what, uh, what are the requirements for a strategy? This we will see if you make a breakdown of these remaining fossil years uh, into countries. If we make the one assumption that from now on every person has the same right for emissions every person on Earth, for the future, not ever, whatever they did in the past. I think anything else you can, will never, no one will be able to sell. And so um, if, this, if you make this assumption, then Japan, Japan has 10 years to go with its present emissions. The European Union, 11. United States, five years. In five years, they're done with their, with their um, budget. Hmm? Uh, and India is 87. That's pretty long. Indonesia and you see China numbers. Now, it, uh, the message of this is pretty clear. Uh, it's time over for, uh, for global solutions as a sum of national solutions. These countries like Japan, Euro United, uh, European Union, United States, will never make it uh, that they, uh, within... Uh, that they reduce uh, by 50% uh, in about eight years on average. That is uh, not uh, conceivable. And um, so uh, either we run into a climate crash, or if they do it by brute force, then there will be an economic crash. So we have choice between two very pretty options, uh, economic crash and climate crash. But uh, we can, again, find a way out. Namely, we see that India and Indonesia and others have much longer times to go. So if you say, well, um, the late countries, their remaining time is okay, but it uh, they cannot take advantage of it if they just wait, because they will become victims of the industrial emissions. Uh -huh. <laughs> they don't have to do the climate change by themselves. The others will do it already. Or they begin to cooperate, the top ones with the bottom ones the desert countries with the um, uh, technology countries, and join their uh, uh, resources and uh, technologies. So if you make a climate and economic security, so climate or an, an economic security can be some simultaneously achieved only by North-South cooperation. And uh, therefore we propose to uh, form 
Desertec Climate and Development Tandems for uh, Global Sustainability. So partners from of these both categories begin to cooperate, and then they can uh, we can uh, th two degree uh, can still be achieved. Now, um, also the time structure uh, was, uh, is this 24 year exit strategy. That, that means after 24 years we have to have be at 50 percent of it, and the remaining to come to zero is in 48. So then we. Uh, so we can distinguish three phases of a clever Desertec global program. And um, the phase one is we would need about six years of high-speed market introduction to make it cheaper than the fossils. And that is policy-driven <coughs> and needs external financial support. A delta is needed as an incentive. Then the phase two, that's about, could be uh, the years indicated there, over 20 years, we need a tremendous collector production capacity scale up to be able to deploy that and to produce all the equipment. So this is an orgy for industry. And um, then uh, about 30 years, high speed collector deployment. Uh, and, and then uh, that would be just market driven. So uh, the second phase needs is also market driven, but needs uh, support by politics. And, um, so, and that would be a way uh, to uh, go along and to achieve it. And the uh, key points here are, to, for a success, is the financing of phase one, that that money is there, which is needed now as an incentive to get the cost reduction process, and then the tandem cooperation in phase two, so that the technology countries and the desert and low developed countries uh, draw up jointly industries for the mass production. Uh, if we leave it to the low developed countries, it will be too slow. So uh, here both sides uh, can, uh, can, could cooperate. Okay, so the fast way would be such desert tech tandems for the phases one and two, which ends up with joint ventures for energy and climate security. So a desert tech tandem, what is that? I just repeat that. It's a cooperation, or it's, it's a developed and a developing country, both sitting on a tandem. And the tandem, everybody knows, is faster uh, than a single uh, person's bicycle. Now, uh, countries from, uh, yeah, so this, now uh, from the, the developed country brings in technology, brings in finance and CO2 reduction needs. And the, uh, the, the developed country. And the developing country brings in development needs, low cost manufacturing opportunities, large growth in population and energy, um, what, which they, what they have to uh, serve, and good deserts. And if such tandems are being formed, then the result is that a, col a, a competitive solar collector industry as joint venture uh, will emerge. And, to, and that can then replace fossil and nuclear fuels on a world market. So with such a general approach, I think uh, it could be done. Now, the money that you need as an incentive at the beginning, one can make an assessment. Uh, and um, by uh, believing, uh, uh, many people say, well, we need about more, 20 more gigawatt of collectors. Then we are at the break even with fossil fuels. And uh, that would cost about <coughs> 10 billion euro. So the 50% of that is still uh, incentive uh, on average over that period of time. Um, that would be 5 billion euro per year. And so, Cost of saving the climate is over 10 year, years period, 5 billion euro per year. I think um, Cordoval, uh, Ireland, and uh, Greece are more expensive. Huh? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Will become more expensive. So uh, I think we are talking about, uh, I was, yes, I was uh, in the Netherlands, and uh, well, they have an annual uh, GNP of 550 billion euro. So it's 1% of the annual GNP for Netherlands. Uh, so that's the money that we are talking about and where we have annual conferences on, <laughs> with no progress so far. Okay, so a recommendation that was sent to the Minister Verhagen in the uh, Netherlands. Netherlands joined uh, a Desert Tech tandem and spent 10 years, 1% of the GNP, for global climate and for their national security. And by this they become also owner uh, of an industry. Um, yeah? So industry is, ever, is denationalized, denationalized anyway. Uh, so, uh, 
Why not do it that way? Oops, yeah, that was one too many. Wait a minute. So here are some examples for tandems for humankind security. So for instance, here you see um, tandem candidates, Europe, European Union and India. So the remaining years uh, for their emissions uh, that they have together is 30 years. That sounds reasonable. In that time, it's not five or eight, it's 30 years. So, so the national, uh, uh, the individual remaining years are 11 and 87, as you see in the next column, in the third column. And in the last column, you see the fraction of world population. Or United States and India, it's 21 years. Japan and China are 22. Un United States and China is 15 years. So that's a little bit tight maybe already. But you see, there are such candidates. And uh, so uh, I think one can draw up a, a scheme how by such uh, tandem configurations um, the problem can be solved. And that will be much easier. You need just two partners from the political and not 200, uh, as they try now for at the uh, climate conferences. And you just take two willing partners. Uh, I think you will find uh, two willing partners uh, for many combinations. So this could be then uh, a way for a strategy for the two degree goal. And here I uh, wrap it up. So first of all, consider Earth as without national borders. Climate is without national borders. Humankind is without national borders. Nations are have national borders. Uh, so uh, this is a very uh, important change in the thinking. Second, um, the techno belt donates 10 years about, if you not have only just ne the Netherlands to it, but if you take the United States, the European Union, and Japan, uh, then it, it takes about for 10 years to get this money together, 0.01% of the income advantage over the rest of the world that the people have in these regions. So, uh, and that is about three euro per, oh, Einwohner, uh, per capita. <laughs> and um, so as an incentive for achieving the fo fossil solar cost break even in desert belt. And then the third point, organize clever uh, uh, desert deck climate and development tandems like, now you see a number of combinations and um, and realize fast production capacity build up for a global transition to worldwide clean power before 2050. Well, build a supergrid that interconnects demand and best sites for renewable energies. And last point, use all renewables, of course, according to availability and feasibility. And then uh, we have a chance. Thank you very much. Thank you.